introduce them to you, Mr. Philip Parham. He is envoy for Commonwealth from the United Kingdom. Mr. Asun Kokstrup, Deputy Head of the Mission Embassy of Denmark in Addis Ababa. Mr. Eugene Torero, he is Director of Trade Policy and Facilitation Trademark East Africa. And Mr. Paul Fakete, he is Senior International Trade Advisor from the USAID. So you have the whole, almost the whole spectrum of the donors uh, before you. As you are all aware, uh, WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement is quite unique in the sense that a lot of emphasis has been given on the provision of assistance and support for capacity building of developing and the least developed countries for implementation of trade facilitation reforms. Now there is one, Article 21, which is specially de dedicated to technical assist or to assistance, where the donors member, donor members agree to facilitate provision of such assistance and the contours of the assistance has also been elaborated to cover assistance within the overall development objectives of a country, activities of the private sector, and to address regional or sub-regional challenges, and it goes on like that. Furthermore, for the first time in any WTO-covered agreement, developing and the least developed countries enjoy the flexibility of implementing measures which are self-selected in category C, conditional on obtaining assistance and support for capacity building. So that's the context in which we are organizing this session and this conversation around uh, donors' support for implementation of trade facilitation reforms. And for the next one hour, we will get insights from donors, first, on their willingness and plans to support countries in the region, second, the outcomes which the donors would like to see from their interventions, and also some of the efforts made at coordination of the donors' interventions. It is more of an informative session, as you can see from the very nature of the conversation, and it is in that spirit I'll now invite Mr. Philip Parham, the Envoy for Commonwealth United Kingdom, to say a few words. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and good morning, everybody, and, and many thanks indeed to UNCTAD for inviting me to be a part of this distinguished panel and for giving me the opportunity to engage with all of you about the role which the UK government is playing internationally to support the implementation of the TFA. Uh, it's a pleasure to see so many people from the public sector, from the business and donor communities, and from regional and international organizations. Uh, that is a real testament both to the importance of this issue and to the collective commitment of the international customs community to implement the TFA, an agreement which offers a huge boost to economic development, to the global trading system, and to wider prosperity and social progress. The UK has been a long-standing advocate of the TFA and has worked actively to support its implementation. For example, over the last three years, our Government Department for Revenue and Customs, known by its acronym HMRC, has delivered, in collaboration with the WCO and UNCTAD, capacity building and technical assistance in 10 least developed countries. This is designed to support the timely implementation of the TFA. HMRC have been doing this particularly in relation to those Category C notifications where there is most need for technical assistance, as the Chair was saying earlier. Through comprehensive needs assessment, we have identified those countries where we can add the most value. And we've achieved significant success already. We've delivered more than 100 capacity building missions and have trained more than 500 trade facilitation stakeholders as part of the work to establish national, committee, national committees on trade facilitation. And just to mention a couple of highlights. The program supported the implementation of risk-based clearance in Sudan, seeing a shift from 100% physical inspection to 15 to 30% green channel clearance at five major customs ports. We saw the first ever advanced rulings in Ethiopia, with 20 rulings being issued so far in 2018. And we've also trained an emergent cadre of 48 internationally accredited experts, 
including eight from the United Kingdom, to build on the customs to customs peer support model of technical assistance and capacity building. This all gives you a flavor of what we have achieved already, but it's important not to rest on our laurels. And with that in mind, it was excellent news that our Prime Minister, Theresa May, announced in April 2018 a further three million pounds of funding over two years to continue capacity building support uh, for the TFA. This formed part of a wider package of support for ambitious objectives set by heads of government of Commonwealth countries at their meeting in London seven months ago. At that meeting, leaders set a bold and broad-ranging agenda to build a common future which is more prosperous, more secure, more sustainable, and more fair. And to boost prosperity in particular, the Commonwealth agreed a number of commitments, including initiatives to promote common standards, to address barriers to women's participation in international trade, and to boost youth employment through a new apprenticeships program. And very importantly, they also agreed to develop a connectivity agenda for trade and investment. These are all significant steps in creating the right conditions for economic growth and development. The renewed funding for this TFA program and the continuation of our work speak volumes for the commitment of the UK to the trade and development agenda. The Africa region is one of the key recipients of our program. We hope to work in partnership with other donors, development partners and recipients to unlock the vast potential of Africa as a trading partner. This is an unprecedented opportunity. We must all grasp the moment to realize its potential. The benefits of the TFA are well known. Full implementation is estimated to reduce trade costs by an average of 14.3% and to boost global trade by up to a trillion dollars per year with the biggest gains in developing countries. These numbers demonstrate the real world value of delivering against this international commitment. But to fully realize these gains, we must all be ambitious and hold ourselves to account for delivery of our commitments. And I'm clear that national committees on trade facilitation are a key driver of these reforms and essential to coordination, both within countries, but also with the wider donor community. Only by working in partnership can we deliver the sustainable impact which will provide for lasting impact in terms of economic development and wider prosperity for societies. So this forum is a timely opportunity to take stock of progress, to share experiences across the region, and to understand how we can build collectively on this platform to deliver real change. So I'm absolutely delighted to see so many of you here today, and I'm excited that the opportunity to be working alongside some of the countries present to support implementation of the TFA provision has been given to us. As we think about how we can best deploy our collective resources, it's important to reflect upon the opportunities for network learning and sharing knowledge across the WTO community and within its regional settings. I've seen some excellent examples from the UK's HMRC capacity building program of how regional networking and the sharing of knowledge can add huge value. Under the previous HMRC program, 466 days of customs expertise were mobilized from 28 different countries, including from 18 developing countries, which contributed some 62% of the deployed expertise. We also supported customs to customs partnerships, which focused on direct implementation experience between Afghanistan and Ethiopia, between, uh, sorry, Afghanistan and Uganda, between Ethiopia and Swaziland, and between Malawi, Sierra Leone, and South Africa. We should continue to take advantage of these opportunities and reap the benefits of individual countries' experience of implementation. This conference and other regional and international forums are a great opportunity to exchange ideas, to identify common issues, and to further embed and build upon existing South-to-South -South cooperation to support trade facilitation reform. The TFA represents an unparalleled opportunity to enhance trade competitiveness, modernize customs procedures, and provide greater transparency and certainty for business. The ratification of the TFA in early 2017 was a key milestone towards realizing these opportunities, and we have made excellent progress towards implementation across WTO membership. But we should use this opportunity to renew efforts to accelerate delivery against each of our TFA commitments. 
the HMRC UNCTAD WCO program is well placed to support that ambition as it uses the leverage of the WCO and UNCTAD's relations with active customs experts within administrations around the world allied to its suite of facilitative instruments and tools. And I'd like to finish by thanking you once again for this opportunity to address you all today and to meet so many representatives from across the customs community. I look forward to hearing the views of others about how we can collectively tap into the opportunities and address the challenges as we continue the path towards full implementation of the TFA. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parham. The next I'll invite Mr. Sun uh, Kokstrup. He's uh, Deputy Head of the Mission Embassy of Denmark here. Sun, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. And uh, thank you for inviting Denmark to participate on this panel at such an important event. Gathering national trade facil uh, facilitation committees could not come at a more interesting time, uh, given the agreement on the African continental free trade area um, earlier this year. I would therefore like to take this opportunity to congratulate the rep representatives uh, present from the 12 countries who have by now, uh, have, uh, by now ratified the agreement and uh, urge the best of you to join, of course. Before providing examples of uh, some of the concrete areas of trade facilitation that Denmark supports, uh, please allow me to briefly sketch the Danish priorities. The Danish development policy focuses on four strategic aims aligned with the SDGs. Peace and security, migration and development, inclusive sustainable growth, uh, and democracy and human rights. As Denmark is a small country, we, have, uh, we also have to acknowledge that we cannot be present everywhere. This means that our development cooperation is focused on a number of priority countries. The majority of these are African, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, Somalia, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. Additionally, we provide support to countries that are transitioning into middle or high income countries in specific strategic areas where Danish competencies can make a difference. And this includes Ghana, Egypt, and South Africa. Our support to these countries uh, in transition is a good example of the Danish view that we need to create partnerships that goes beyond the traditional donor recipient relationship. To achieve inclusive, sustainable growth and development, we need to support the establishment of a solid private sector able to compete at the international markets. And in order to do so, free trade is key. Denmark therefore supports trade facilitation globally and nationally, uh, nationally through multilateral as well as bilateral partners, politically as well as financially. Our support to the ITC is one, and our work within the uh, World Trade Organization to promote the interest of the least developed countries and ensure their access to global markets is another. But allow me to mention a couple of other specific Danish engagements. Denmark was one of the countries behind the establishment of Trademark East Africa, and we are still proudly supporting their work. I'm therefore also pleased to be joined in the panel by exactly this organization. It has done a tremendous job in improving the conditions for trade by breaking down barriers, ensuring coordination across customs offices, operationalizing one-stop border posts and investing in infrastructure in the East African community. The expansion of Trademark East Africa into new countries is a testament to their success. In fact, the achievements of Trademark East Africa were acknowledged also in Nigeria, and therefore Denmark launched a large-scale assessment of the current obstacles to trade in the ECOWAS region. The aim was to establish a similar structure to Trademark East Africa in this region a couple of years ago. The project Accelerating Trade in West Africa, ATWA, laid the foundation for what is now a multi-donor trade facilitation project in West Africa. At a continental level, we have initiated a dialogue with the African Union Commission on how Denmark might be able to contribute to the further operationalization of the African continental free trade area. As a small open economy, Denmark has witnessed the prosperity that has come from the creation of an internal market within the European Union. And we hope that all of you will benefit equally from enhanced trade across the continent. We will be happy to discuss ways we can cooperate to make this vision a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Sun. 
Uh, next, I'll invite uh, Mr. Eugene Torero, who is Director of Trade Policy uh, and Facilitation from Trademark East Africa. He will bring in a different perspective in the sense that he's not representing a donor government. He, it represents an agency, which is an implementation agency and the recipient of the donor funds and, uh, and doing quite a lot of work in this area, in this region. Eugene, you have the floor. <clears throat> Thank you, moderator, for the opportunity to participate on this panel. Like we said, uh, and just to clarify that Trademark East Africa is a multi-donor agency funded by eight countries, donor countries. Our major donor is United Kingdom, funding us more than 80% of, of, of our operations. Um, we are also funded by U.S., the U.S. government, which is actually supporting the TF implementation in the East African region. So for all the, the establishments of National Trade Facilitation Committee, the trade portals, we saw the uh, regionalization of the EO uh, activities that we were discussing yesterday and last week uh, in Arusha were supported by the U.S. government uh, through Trademark East Africa. Uh, we are also funded by Danida, as rightly said by um, uh, uh, the representative from Denmark, the Netherlands, Finland, Canada, Norway, uh, and Belgium. Our work is governed by two pillars, reducing barriers to trade and supporting business to access markets. On the opening day, I try to share uh, our engagements around infrastructure at the ports of uh, the at the ports at the port of Mombasa, but also along the trade corridors connecting East Africa. For those of you who are aware with, uh, of East Africa, East Africa is connected by two corridors. A northern corridor running from Mombasa through Uganda, Rwanda, Democratic Republic of Congo, and to the north of, of Uganda, Southern Sudan. South Sudan, not Southern Sudan. Um, uh, also via Nairobi, you can actually call to Addis Ababa through Moyari. So you may want to call it Mo uh, Mombasa, Nairobi, uh, Addis Corridor, which we have started a new program. Under the, the first pillar, our work is, again, as I said, on the ports, at the borders on, on one-stop border posts, where we have um, uh, so far completed 15 uh, one-stop border posts, reducing the time to clear cargo through uh, uh, borders by more than 40 percent, but along the corridors, more than 70 percent. We have done this in partnership with uh, um, representatives of governments of East Africa that we are represented here, and we thank them for, for that. We have also done in coordination with other uh, uh, agencies like World Bank, like uh, um, JICA, like uh, um, IOM. Um, what, what have we achieved? We have achieved, we've been able to achieve so much because of the regional setup of East Africa that is governed by a single uh, customs law, and therefore it makes our work to help uh, um, partner states to um, synchronize their, their work, harmonize their, their laws, procedures, simplify where it is difficult. Additionally, other than the hard infrastructure that I mentioned, we've also tried to help uh, with the softer components. The softer components in include the review of laws that were a little bit cumbersome to trade, and these have been simplified to allow and simplify free flow of goods uh, along the, 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 the different cultures that I mentioned. For example, the EAC, um, again using funds from uh, Canada government, established a single customs territory framework. That single customs ter territory framework has allowed officials from Rwanda, Uganda, Burundi to set up at the, the ports of Mombasa and Dar es Salaam to be able to clear goods at the first point of entry. And that has allowed uh, customs services to be able to start planning using, the, they've actually been able to connect their systems and start planning before goods get to their point of destination. 
and we think that has really, really made things uh, change. At the borders, where we have set up OSBPs, we've also gone ahead to facilitate the, the government to um, uh, establish the coordinated border management that a colleague from Rwanda was uh, presenting on yesterday, and I think moderated by a very good uh, friend uh, from the, the we saw. What we have seen is this need to engage at step one uh, with all stakeholders, bring them together, be able to chat the way they, are, they should cooperate, the way they should uh, uh, coordinate, build transparency relationships, and we think that has actually made the results within East Africa be what it is. If the partners were not really committed, owning the whole process, that would not have happened. The other pillar that I mentioned of improving business uh, competitiveness goes around standards uh, simplification. Um, uh, the ESC standards bodies have come together, uh, agreed to harmonize standards building on, on the regulations that, that, that govern standards uh, uh, in East Africa. And they have gone a step further to mutually recognize certificates of assessment that has been issued by one, border, by one uh, standards body to be recognized by another in another importing country. And we think, again, that has reduced significantly the time to clear goods along the, the transport, the, the corridors. But what do we, why do we think there has been a success? Number one, there has been political commitment to make things happen within the ESC. Number two, we've seen the ministries of trade owning the whole process. Our governance framework suggests that we work with the implementing partners to set up an oversight committee that oversees what we do. And in that process, they vet what we do and approve what we are doing. And we think that has built some kind of ownership. But as, as I said earlier, we also think that partnership is key. I mentioned yesterday that we work with UNCTAD, with other uh, donor agencies, to collaborate, to coordinate the activities that we, we deliver. And where we, we fail short of skills, we've leveraged on others. And we think that is the way as actually required by the TFA. Um, lastly, uh, uh, moderator, I think the regional aspects, the regional aspects to uh, TFA can be achieved if we, we work together within as a region, I mean, as has been demonstrated in the East African region. But uh, I also want to make this, this clear that we have all to play our part. We've had the TFA uh, agreed upon, I think, uh, since, uh, since uh, 2017. Um, there are a number of uh, um, notifications we have made around category A. We've also, <clears throat> some countries have stabilized A and B. We've seen those that we can uh, implement by ourselves without requiring donor funds. And therefore, we should show commitment and deliver those uh, uh, measures that we can implement by ourselves. I think when we try to work around uh, uh, commitment, showing interest in delivering our, uh, our, our what we have actually notified or um, uh, committed to, it makes it much easier for any willing donor. We have all to appreciate that resources are be becoming rather difficult. And therefore, we need to play our part in ensuring that whatever we need to achieve or deliver or making trade happen within our country or respective countries uh, uh, is very clear. So that political commitment is very key. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Eugene. So this was on the use of the donor's money. Okay, now we have uh, Mr. Paul Fekete, Senior International Trade Advisor from USAID. Mr. Fekete, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I'd like to add my thanks to the organizers and supporters for bringing us all together here in Addis for this very helpful and uh, valuable opportunity to exchange information on our implementation of the Trade Facilitation Agreement. Um, I just want to take a few minutes to talk a little about USAID and our work and our support for a variety of initiatives all related to trade facilitation and the uh, TFA in particular. Of course, USAID's uh, support for capacity building or aid for trade has not, is not something that has been uh, solely a function of the conclusion of the trade facilitation agreement, uh, but is something that has been a part of our support for the region uh, for many decades. 
we do this because it's a cost-effective and efficient manner of stimulating economic growth in developing countries and supporting the development uh, aspirations uh, of, 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 of the continent. It's also worth saying, I think, that uh, improving global trade with partner countries uh, has significant benefits. I think uh, we've heard uh, many of the economic analyses that have been done about the impact, uh, the positive impact of the trade facilitation agreement. But I think it's also worth saying that we do it for our own self-interest. Uh, we know that uh, by helping countries in the region and around the world, that has an impact, a positive one, on ourselves as well. Uh, USAID has been a very significant supporter for capacity building or aid for trade. Since 1999, the U.S. government has provided a cumulative amount of about $18.5 billion in trade capacity building, making it one of the leading international donors on TCB. And in the area of trade facilitation alone, our support has amounted to about $3.5 billion. I'd like to talk about our approach to the implementation of trade facilitation reforms and the trade facilitation agreement in particular. Uh, we have a variety of mechanisms, a variety of, uh, of, of activities that we support, including uh, Trademark East Africa, as already been mentioned. But I'd like to focus on sort of conceptually how we approach this, because we have what I characterize as a three-legged stool, if you will, uh, for supporting uh, trade facilitation. On the one hand, we have the sort of traditional programs that we have had for many years, uh, which work both at the bilateral level with individual countries, as well as at the regional level. Uh, many of you, I think, will be familiar with the USAID trade hubs that we have uh, in East, Southern, and Western Africa on the continent. A second element of the support that we provide is uh, our assistance uh, to the World Bank's Trade Facilitation Support Program, which we've also heard about a little more uh, over the course of the last few days. USAID was uh, one of the catalysts for the development of that uh, trust fund, and uh, we continue to provide support to them uh, because we recognize that uh, sometimes as donors, uh, we may not necessarily be able to respond to all of the needs in as timely a fashion as would be desirable. And so we work collaboratively with our colleagues at the bank to make sure that we are as responsive as possible to the requests and the needs that are posed by the countries that are implementing trade, re trade facilitation reforms. The last uh, element or the last leg of, that, of this uh, stool is, uh, is our support to the Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation. Again, something that you've heard something about over the course of the last two days. And I would commend everyone to join us for a side event that will be held at 1 p.m., which will delve in more detail into the activities of the, of the, of the alliance. But again, USAID was very uh, instrumental, I think, in helping uh, pull together the donors that are part of that effort. And we now have uh, six donors in total because we recognize that the value of implementing the trade facilitation agreement ultimately fell to the private sector. And without the private sector's active participation in an entity like the Alliance, we really would not be implementing trade facilitation reforms in a fashion that would be most meaningful uh, to the private sector. Uh, so we have a very significant uh, and uh, large commitment to the uh, Alliance and uh, continue to uh, encourage and support its expansion into countries both here in Africa but around the world. Let me give a little more examples of some of the work that we've done uh, through some of the USAID specific programs uh, because we have, of course, a fairly significant engagement uh, both at the bilateral level with countries like Ghana and Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire and Zambia and Mozambique and others. And in these countries, we were really trying to respond to the needs that have been identified by the host countries, and we try to support them in a way that will support their uh, uh, implementation plans. And that's something that I think I want to sort of highlight uh, at this point, uh, which is that uh, we very much try to follow the principles of the Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness. And in particular, I'm referring to the idea of country ownership and mutual accountability. Uh, we want to be supportive of your development plans and your development strategies. Uh, we don't want to come in with a preconceived notion of what it is that we think you need, uh, but to support the priorities and the uh, uh, strategies that you will have developed. And that's why, of course, uh, we believe that this session on trade facilitation committees is so important because we see those entities as the primary vehicle for helping prioritize and identify the areas in which we as donors can then come in uh, to support in an ongoing fashion. 
Um, we also have done a lot of uh, work with uh, the regional economic uh, communities. Uh, uh, we've uh, helped, uh, for example, uh, with uh, the development of SADC's uh, trade facilitation strategy. Uh, more recently, we've been working with ECOWAS on the establishment of a regional trade facilitation committee. Uh, we, of course, have worked uh, in East Africa with the EAC and uh, COMESA as well. So again, uh, I don't need to say that uh, you know our uh, our engagement has been uh, has been quite broad. So. In the interest of time and in the interest of encouraging more of a dialogue, uh, I'll stop there and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thanks. So I think uh, you have got now a fair idea from these uh, uh, four presentations about uh, you know, the donors' strategies and plans in the region, some of these illustrations of the outcomes you know, which have been achieved as a result of their support as well as you have also have fairly good idea of some of the financial commitments uh, which have been made to support TF reforms. As I said, this is more of an information session. Now we'll throw it open to all of you to intervene if you have further clarifications, further information, or your own comments. Please, the floor is yours. Yes, sir. Cameroon, you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Modérateur. La plupart de nos comités nationaux de facilitation des échanges accompagnent leurs pays actuellement dans le processus d'élaboration des plans d'assistance technique sur la base des mesures de catégorie C. Donc, euh, nous voudrions savoir complètement, euh, concrètement comment est-ce qu'il faudrait procéder par la suite dès que ces plans d'assistance technique euh, seront adoptés, validés en interne. Euh, quelle, seront, quelle sera la prochaine étape euh, pour nous, pour l'organisation des tables rondes avec les donateurs Est-ce qu'il y a un accompagnement particulier euh, dans ce processus Voilà. Comment on va procéder de manière concrète donc, euh, pour euh, euh, avoir le soutien des donateurs sur la base des documents élaborés euh, en matière euh, d'assistance technique Merci. Thank you, Cameroon. You have the floor, sir. Bien, merci, euh, monsieur le modérateur, pour la parole. Euh, je vais commencer naturellement par euh, euh, remercier les différents intervenants pour euh, la clarté euh, de leurs interventions. Et à la suite de cela, en fait, euh, ayant suivi toutes ces interventions, je me suis rendu compte que, euh, essentiellement, L'assistance est, est destinée aux au regroupements sous-régionaux, bien que par-ci et là, on peut retrouver quelques interventions au niveau du pays. Mais il me semble, à la lecture, ou après avoir entendu ces interventions, qu'il y a quelques régions au niveau de l'Afrique qui sont particulièrement prises en compte et que euh, je venais de me rendre compte que l'Afrique centrale particulièrement, donc la CAC, pour être plus précis, euh, n'est pas bénéficiaire de manière substantielle euh, de ces différentes assistances. Donc, euh, est-ce qu'il y a des raisons particulières qui euh, les justifient, si euh, tel était le cas Et enfin, c'est une proposition pratiquement qui se rallie à ce que venait de dire notre collègue du, du Cameroun, après que nous avons réalisé au niveau des États le travail sur la formation des requêtes et les, les, les besoins, comment va s'organiser concrètement les, les partenariats, s'il faut que je, je le dise ainsi, entre les comités nationaux des façons d'échange et les différentes institutions que vous représentez. Merci. 
Thank you. I recognize uh, the delegate from Egypt, please. Thanks so much. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, uh, presenters, for your presentation. Uh, really, it is a very fruitful uh, discussion with donor, and this is uh, the critical uh, provision uh, of uh, trade facilitation agreement, of course. Uh, technical assistance is uh, the key, uh, uh, key provision of trade facilitation, and of course, this, ses ses this uh, session reflects this uh, technical uh, provision of trade facilitation. Uh, regarding the, uh, regarding the, uh, uh, the assistance of donors, there is uh, financial assistance, and this is very uh, important uh, for a developing country. Uh, so, in this regard, I have just uh, two questions. The first is what, what kind of forms uh, of uh, financial uh, assistance? Is it in the form of loans or grants? This is very important, uh, especially when we speak uh, about infrastructure, for example. The second uh, question regarding uh, the, best, the best practices of receiving uh, fund from the donor. Uh, should we communicate directly with a country uh, like you, or we should uh, uh, communicate with an organization such as uh, UNCTAD and, uh, and so on? Thank you so much for you. Thank you, Egypt. Now I give the floor to the representative of ECOWAS, please. Thank you and good morning. Moderator, thank all the distinguished panelists for their presentations. Um, ECOWAS acknowledges and thanks the partners in supporting our development priorities. In particular, we acknowledge the support provided by USAID in a number of areas, including trade facilitation and development of uh, an AGOA regional strategy. My question is on the US trade hubs. Um, obviously, we have one in West Africa, which has recently closed, and we are awaiting the opening of the next phase. Um, the previous phase greatly benefited not only the regional organization but our member states. But there is a concern that perhaps the support towards this hub um, would not be in the same magnitude as previously. So it would be interesting to know exactly when this new trade hub in West Africa will be established and what magnitude of funding will be available towards it. Thank you. Thank you. I think. Uh if I can see properly, it is Liberia. Am I right? Yes, delegate from Liberia. Good morning, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, and others on the, on the panel, I say thanks ever so much for the level of information given to us from the donor community. But then uh, I've observed over the past period of time that uh, with all of the support given to the to the uh, to countries, specifically in Africa, there are also major challenges. Since your support, we've observed that there are still challenges from African countries. So, my my question to you is: With all of the support you've been giving, what are some of the major challenges have you identified from the from the countries? And how can these challenges be entrenched to opportunity? And at the same time, have you been able to give direct support to academic institutions? Because I, I did not hear any of the, of the speakers talking about direct support to academic institutions. Like for example, I, I, we know about the trade school here in uh, Tanzania and other schools in Africa that are interested in trade and other related trade. Uh, or disciplines. So what are some of your, your pressing, your, your support to academic institutions uh, in Africa and other uh, uh, countries that are interested in the TFA measures? Thank you very much. Thank you. Now uh, Burkina Faso, please. No? Is it, uh, I am not able to read your uh, flag, please. It's, please. Cote d'Ivoire. Cote d'Ivoire. Oh, uh, merci beaucoup à tous les, à Monsieur le modérateur et à tous les, uh, les intervenants. Uh, la Côte d'Ivoire tient à remercier 
tous les bailleurs de fonds et particulièrement l'USAID qui nous a accompagnés ces, ces derniers moments au niveau du Comité national de facilitation des échanges dans plusieurs euh, programmes. Mais j'ai une toute petite question à poser à l'USAID relativement à notre programme d'OEA, sur le programme de l'EA. Euh, je voudrais savoir si vous avez en perspective un programme d'accompagnement, surtout euh, pour euh, le lancement de la phase pilote, la vulgarisation de ce programme à travers euh, des formations sur les avantages et la finalisation de, des directives pour orienter la mise en œuvre. Merci. Now we have uh, Mali, please. Uh, merci, Monsieur le modérateur. Je remercie infiniment les représentants des partenaires techniques et financiers ou bailleurs de fonds uh, pour, la, pour la clarté de leur présentation. Et je pense notamment. Euh, quel sera votre appui, votre rapport plutôt, avec euh, les cadres intégrés pour le commerce dans les, dans les paiements comme le Mali, en passant à votre rôle de, de coordination Au, au passage, d'ailleurs, je remercie, euh, je remercie euh, le Royaume du Danemark pour son rôle de facilitateur, de donateur du, du cadre intégré au niveau de, de mon pays au Mali. J'aimerais savoir, euh, euh, j'ai une question aussi pour les représentants de, les, euh, du Royaume-Uni. Il a parlé de 300 livres pour, pour, pour appuyer les mesures de facilitation des échanges. Quel, euh, quel, euh, comment, procéder, comment procéder pour demander euh, la, cet appui Je vous remercie. Je vais passer la parole à mon collègue. D'accord, merci bien. Et merci de m'avoir passé la parole. Et moi, je voudrais savoir, euh, c'est par rapport à l'USAID. Nous, au Mali, euh, nous avons un moment donné saisi l'USAID à travers... Euh, euh, l'AGUA, le comité national AGUA au Mali, pour pouvoir ex exporter vers les États-Unis. Mais malheureusement, jusque-là, nous n'avons pas pu avoir de suite, parce que ce qui m'amène à croire que eh, des structures comme l'ISAID ont surtout orienté le financement vers les organisations régionales et sous-régionales. Sinon, en réalité, au Mali, depuis quelques années maintenant, et on envoie des courriers à l'ISAID, mais on se demande s'il y a d'autres façons de faire en dehors de ce que nous, on a déjà fait. Est-ce qu'il y a une façon spécifique de saisir l'ISAID en dehors de ce que nous, on sait déjà C'est-à-dire saisir l'ISAID par courrier, demander soit rendez-vous pour vraiment demander un accompagnement. Et, 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 merci beaucoup, monsieur, madame, je monsieur, merci. Thank you. I give the floor to Gabon, please. Je vous remercie, Monsieur le Président, mais il y avait des pancartes qui étaient levées avant moi, mais comme vous m'accordez ma chance, je, je la saisis. Je, bonjour, chers collègues. C'est juste une brève euh, intervention qui n'a pas d'autre euh, objectif que de, de rappeler à quel point cette session est importante, comme l'a dit l'honorable délégué donc, de l'Égypte, car euh, un forum... Sans une foire à l'assistance technique pour la mise en œuvre de tout ce que nous avons à faire, euh, parfois peut, peut se révéler euh, euh, d'une insuffisance euh, notoire. Donc c'est de ce point de vue que, comme nous le savons tous, euh, la notification parfois que nous avons à faire pour les mesures des catégories B et C est liée à la capacité des États à d'abord élaborer des projets, à approcher des bailleurs pour avoir une idée réelle sur les coûts, et sur la durée d'exécution. Et tant qu'on n'a pas réussi à faire cet exercice pré pré préalable, euh, ben, généralement c'est difficile de terminer avec le processus de notification. Donc c'est pour ça que euh, la présente n'a pas d'autre objectif 
que de remercier les bailleurs ici présents par rapport à cet engagement clair, mais qui devrait être complété par, euh, on va dire, euh, euh, une signification plus optimale de l'aide disponible, notamment comme on a eu, eu l'occasion de le voir lors de la dernière conférence ministérielle de l'Organisation mondiale du commerce à Buenos Aires, on a eu l'occasion de voir, euh, d'avoir eu un, un schéma global sur ce que chaque donateur ou chaque pays euh, développé était disposé à mettre à la disposition de telle structure ou de tel autre objectif à atteindre. Donc c'est euh, la, la délégation du Gabon ici euh, a une préoccupation, c'est celle de voir de manière plus explicite, donc dans un document peut-être euh, plus ou moins euh, élaboré, l'assistance technique nécessaire et la forme qui s'y est, où elle est financière, où elle est technique, pour que nous puissions savoir exactement comment faire pour procéder à la procédure de, de demande. Donc, euh, et demander par la suite aussi euh, un peu plus d'engagement, parce que aujourd'hui le panel qui est ici présent n'est pas complètement représentatif de l'assistance technique disponible. Il y en a d'autres qui sont dans la salle. C'est peut-être demander plus d'engagement de la part des pays développés, de la part des bailleurs de fonds, de la part des partenaires techniques et financiers, pour essayer de soutenir les pays en développement dans cet effort qui est celui de mettre en œuvre les mesures de facilitation des échanges. Donc voilà ce que j'avais à dire en étant conscient que sans assistance technique aujourd'hui, avec le contexte budgétaire qui est celui de nombreux pays africains, on n'aura pas beaucoup de possibilités de mettre en œuvre ces mesures de facilitation. Je vous remercie pour la parole, Monsieur le Président. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I will, ha I will have to, uh, you are at his side, I would like to uh, give uh, special appreciation uh, for the support that we've been getting through USAID Trade Hub. Of course, it's enormous. Uh, regards to the strengthening of the uh, national, national committees, especially TBT and the SPS. These committees were launched in uh, 2017 and the support of USAID Trade Hub. So we thank you so much for that support and because that is so much related with TFA agenda. So we thank you so much and we encourage you to continuously uh, supporting us in these kind of initiatives uh, uh, to, for Tanzania and uh, other, interesting, uh, other interested uh, parties. And also, um, Yeah, of course. Um, I'm just urging uh, USAID Hub to continue sustain, uh, to continuously uh, uh, supporting uh, these kind of initiatives. I thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, ma. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning. Um, thank you for the beautiful presentations um, all along. Uh, my question will be very brief. We've been having a lot of support from development partners and donor agencies. Um, but I want to, my finding, or what I learned is that most of this support is um, towards soft infrastructures, that's um, capacity building majorly. So, and um, you know, some of the challenges we have in Africa is the attitude to which our governments pay to uh, development infrastructures. So it is, um, it was surprising that we'll be talking about this here, that we need support to build hard infrastructures, which obviously will help us to facilitate trade, really. You know, when you talk of things like um, construction of roads, um, fixed canals, you know, our ports and all the rest. So I'm directing this to all the donor agencies and development partners, that they should please channel some of their support toward development of our hard infrastructure so that really trade can be facilitated in Africa because some of our governments have this problem. They are not paying the right um, attention to uh, this area. So we, we really need support to be channeled towards this um, ad infrastructure development. Thank you. Then there is a, yes, yes ma'am. Merci, Monsieur le modérateur, c'est le Sénégal. Uh, bonjour uh, tout le monde. Je m'associe aux remerciements qui ont été adressés aux partenaires techniques et financiers 
pour qui, dans l'ensemble, ont également appuyé le Sénégal dans la mise en œuvre de l'accord sur la facilitation des échanges. Je voudrais juste euh, partager quelques préoccupations et remarques par rapport euh, à euh, la fourniture euh, de, de, de l'assistance technique que nous avons notée euh, suite au déroulement de, de certains projets. Euh, le premier élément, c'est que nous constatons une approche euh, disparate, très dispersée euh, dans la mise en œuvre, ce qui contraste avec même le travail des, des, des États euh, qui ont, euh, disons, euh, élaboré des programmes très structurés avec des projets. Mais ce que nous remarquons euh, au final, euh, c'est que les partenaires appuient euh, peut-être une ou deux activités. Et nous nous retrouvons euh, dans l'obligation peut-être d'évaluer euh, la mise en œuvre et peut-être euh, de rechercher euh, euh, des partenaires ou des fonds euh, additionnels. Et d'autant plus qu'il n'y a pas euh, parfois euh, assez de visibilité sur l'impact même euh, des résultats euh, de ces activités sur les objectifs de mise en conformité avec les mesures euh, de l'accord sur la facilitation would have in place uh, conditions or measures that would encourage uh, the beneficiaries of, of this support uh, uh, to sustain uh, 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 the support or the projects beyond uh, the lifespan. Because in most cases you find that uh, the support is there Uh, once the support is uh, has come to uh, uh, to its completion, uh, the beneficia beneficiaries would have the challenge of uh, uh, sustaining that support. Whether in giving that support, uh, uh, you put a condition or a measure that would encourage the beneficiaries to, uh, to sustain uh, that support. And then the second question, uh, probably it's a Uh, is directed to USAID that uh, we have submitted a, a, a request uh, uh, to develop an AGOA strategy and implementation plan. Uh, yes, we've been supported by the U.S. Embassy uh, based in Eswatini, but it appears that uh, uh, the response uh, from the USAID uh, uh, office Uh, maybe because of the change in uh, uh, in coordination, uh, it has not been uh, forthcoming. Uh, thank you, moderator. Thank you. I think the last question or comment from this side. Whose flag was raised? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you, moderator, for giving me the floor. Uh, mine will be rather a comment. Uh, I will not have uh, any questions. Uh, I'd also like to uh, give thanks for this uh, forum. Uh, Kenya and uh, those of us from the East African region, we've had uh, programs for assistance in this area, either directly with the development partners at the TEPO, or through Trademark East Africa. I think the Trademark East Africa has provided a bridge between the development partners and those of us who are recipients in the East African region. And uh, it's a good example which has uh, worked and uh, we look forward to strengthening this partnership so that we can deliver more in uh, our trade development, uh, in the trade facilitation agenda ahead. Now, when it comes also to the issue of uh, leveraging on skills, we've seen this work uh, well, where we have worked with Trade Magist Africa and also others like UNCTAD and ITC to deliver on some of the products which we kindly have. So I think it's, it's a good partnership which we've seen it work and we look forward to strengthening this kind of partnership so that we can deliver more. Thank you. Thank you. I think if I may summarize your questions, uh, one category was very specific information sought from the panelists, mainly from the USAID and the UK, 
then most of you wanted to ask questions about how to access actually the donors funds that has been quite a common theme which is coming around in the questions then another uh, set is context and then of course it was about the coordination and the sustainability of support activity of the activities beyond the project period i think that if i may summarize that's the kind of questions that have been uh, that have come so i will now invite uh, first i think let me start with uh, you if you yeah <laughs> Mr. Fekete, I think that's... All, right. uh, All right, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure what time we have available, and so um, given, given the time constraints, uh, let, let me first and foremost make uh, the offer that uh, I'm more than happy to engage with any delegation on the margins of the meeting. So uh, if I am not able to address your specific uh, question uh, during this uh, response, uh, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to, uh, to follow up with you uh, uh, separately. Um, there's a number of issues that were raised, obviously, many of them that were directed towards USAID and specific programs. And rather than sort of specifically try to respond to each and every one, let me just make a couple of comments. Uh, as far as the Africa trade hubs are concerned, uh, I, I think it's safe to say that uh, we have seen cycles of increasing and decreasing levels of funding over the years that the existence of the trade hubs. Uh, this is uh, obviously something that uh, is of concern to us at USAID, but in some measures, is not always Good morning, First, let me thank the organizers for the opportunity of moderating this panel. It is a real pleasure to, to be here at the Forum for National Trade Facilitations Committee, Committees. This morning's session is entitled Available Technical Assistance and Capacity Building in Africa for the Implementation of Trade Facilitation Reforms. We will highlight the role of international organizations in delivering technical assistance to support the implementation of the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement. Today's speakers will present their main activities and share some of the fruitful experiences working with countries and development partners. This will also be a valuable opportunity to engage with partners seeking further opportunities to collaborate. The session, this session is a very good complement to the, the previous session, building upon the, the donor inputs that we just heard. Let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Jonathan Werner. I am a country coordinator for the EIF. I see many of the EIF beneficiaries present here today. So please don't be shy to share some of your experiences. For those that are not familiar with the EIF, we are a multilateral partnership comprised of eight core agencies, including UNCTAD, the World Bank, the International Trade Center, and the WTO. The EIF is a partnership of over 20 donors working in more than 50 countries. Our main participation, our main preoccupation is to bridge partners, resources, and expertise, bring, bring these all together in order to support LDCs in the use of trade for poverty reduction and promoting promoting inclusive and sustainable growth. Trade facilitation is a very important part of our work, and we include it through all of EIF funding modalities. In the trade facilitation space, the EIF was tasked with ensuring <clears throat> some of the existing structures are not duplicated, allowing for a better coordination of resources on the ground. Some concrete examples of what we do. For example, the EIF supports countries and partners in undertaking DTISs and DTIS updates, and throughout that process, we always have a preoccupation with our partners and countries that trade facilitation is very prominent in the reports. Throughout the Tier 1 funding, what we call institutional support for ministries of trade and commerce, countries receive budgetary support, and in many of the cases, these resources enable the work of EIF national steering committees, and more and more, these committees have complemented and played a role with national trade facilitation committees. The EIF national implementation units have assisted ministries of trade in outreach, in ratification, in needs assessments, and interagency coordination. To exemplify a few of the other uh, areas of our work, in Rwanda, the EIF and, gov and the government of Rwanda have built cross-border market centers 
uh, in the borders of Uganda and Democratic Republic of Congo to facilitate trade, improving facilities for local traders, 74% of which are women. In collaboration with Trademark East Africa, the World Bank, and other partners, this initiative is part of a cohesive program on trade facilitation targeting women and small-scale partners. Another example is in the Gambia, where the EIF has supported the Gambia International Airline Cargo Facility Complex in Banjo International Airport. The Gambia is one of the smallest countries in Africa, and this new facility with storage will provide storage with, for perishable and non-perishable goods and facilitate trade for small-scale farmers as well. So without further ado, let's start with our panel. First, we'll hear from Mr. Mark Henderson, which will illustrate how the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement Facility is working how, and how countries can make its best use. Mark? Thanks, Jonathan. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm afraid I'm going to break every rule in the book and start with an apology. Uh, it's the third day of our, of our work here together, and I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I have to confess, I do have some, some PowerPoint slides for you. Um, I am going to be talking about a, a grant program. Grant programs have rules, and therefore I think it's important to be clear, and so I do, I do have some, some slides with, with some of those rules on there. Uh, I can promise, however, I'll move through them quickly. Um, and hopefully it won't contribute to the, the PowerPoint fatigue that we're no doubt all feeling. Um, so, as, as Jonathan mentioned, I want to uh, speak on the WTO TFA Facility Grant Program, which as you can see from the screen was launched on the 9th of October this year in the margins of the recent TF Committee in Geneva. Uh, my presentation has three main elements to it, as you can see here. Uh, there are around 15 slides, and I want to leave you with two major takeaway points. So the structure of the presentation is to cover what are the grants, who can apply, and how to apply. First of all, what are the TFA grants? Uh, it's a program that balances a number of priorities that you can see on the screen here. Uh, importantly, the, the grants are for the implementation of Category C provisions of the TFA. So on Tuesday, I gave you a, an update on the notifications that we've received, and I mentioned then that it's very important that if you wish to receive support from the TFA facility grants, then you need to have notified your Category C provisions. There, are, there is an element of the, of the grants program that can help you to apply for other funding. So we're trying to facilitate uh, the perhaps larger scale funding applications that you, that you need. There was some mention of, of infrastructure projects and, and things in the first session. There's an element of the grant scheme that can contribute to applications for, for large, larger scale assistance. Uh, it's for applicants, for WTO members that cannot access assistance elsewhere. And that element is an important one, and I'll explain how we deal with that priority, how we balance that in the procedures of the grant program. Uh, the project implementation grants that I will explain are for soft infrastructure. They have a maximum limit of 200,000 US dollars, and therefore they're not suitable for hard infrastructure. This grant scheme is not the answer to everybody's needs, but it does have a very specific purpose, and I think it, uh, it does contribute to the implementation of the TFA. The final point is that we are here, as mentioned uh, by the, the UK representative in the previous panel, and, and thank you to him for that, that we are here to help match needs with donors, and there's a specific element of the grants program that tries to assist in that process. So what are the TFAF grants? Step one for all applicants is to complete an expression of interest. And I'm going to show you the very simple and straightforward steps that are necessary to complete that. The expression of interest must be completed by everybody, whether they want the project preparation grants, which are those that help you to apply for, for further funding and that have a maximum limit of, of 30,000 US dollars, 
or whether you wish to apply for the project implementation grants, the, the grants that assist in implementing the, the Category C commitments. And those are the ones with the upper limit of 200,000 US dollars. So who can apply? The grants themselves are only for members who are not subject to administrative measures. But it's important to note that WTO observers and those in the accessions process can complete the expressions of interest process and we will help them to try and identify relevant donors. It's for those members who've deposited the TFA instrument of acceptance and I showed on Tuesday the assistance that we give to help uh, those 16 remaining members that, that still need to uh, deposit their, their instrument of acceptance. I've mentioned already it's for those that have notified their Category C commitments. There must be an attempt to find uh, the traditional donors first. There's a lot of TF support out there. We don't want to compete with that existing provision. So efforts must have been made to seek help through the traditional donors, as I would refer to them. The applications must be endorsed by the National Committee. That's very important for our subject today. We need that uh, kind of cross-government and private sector buy-in. There needs to be a demonstration that everybody's on board with the applications. And then finally, in the same sense of cohesion and a, a common purpose, any regional applications must be endorsed by the regional economic body. So, how to apply? It's very straightforward. On the TFAF facility.org website, there is a, a tab along the top uh, on um, TFAF assistance, and underneath that there's the grant program, and it has this orange button that you can see where you press apply. Underneath there, we have copies of the operational rules, which are the, the, the technical rules of the grant program. Uh, we have the, the guidelines, and that's what you can see on the screen now. Uh, in all three working languages of the WTO, the, the guidelines are written in more accessible language than the rules, and they help, as the name suggests, guide you through the application process. I would recommend to download and take a look at the, the guidelines, because we think that they're, they're accessible and straightforward. So, the expression of interest process is the one that I want to focus on briefly now. This is the, the tool that we use to ensure that the grant program maintains its intended backstop function and doesn't become the first port of call, doesn't compete with other provision that's out there of assistance. We request some basic clear information on needs that are collected from applicants, and that's through an online form. We then circulate that information to all relevant donors. That's the process that the, the UK representative in the first session was talking about. We set a shorter deadline for the project preparation grants, the smaller grants, of two to three weeks, and a longer deadline of three to four weeks for the project implementation grant requests. And if we don't hear anything back from the donors within that time period, then we understand the message is, go ahead with the grant application. If we do hear something from the donors, the response should be, no, we can help with that problem. So we like to think that it's a win-win situation. You either get a response that says an existing donor can help or your application moves forward for a TFAF grant. I want to quickly show you a couple of slides of the questions that we ask just to give you a, a flavour of how straightforward it is. The first question is, do you meet the essential criteria? I've discussed those criteria already. Here you tick yes, you move on. Second question, contact details. It's fairly straightforward, self-explanatory. You complete that so that we can be in touch with you and move on to the next question. Next question is where you need assistance. Obviously, we need to understand which element of the TFA you want to focus on. We then need a little bit of background. What the situation, well, what the, the assistance that you require is and what the current situation on that topic is in your country. The penultimate question is, which countries, which donors or organizations have you already approached for assistance? And please give us their contact details and the reason why they can't help. The last question is a little bit of detail on the backing of the, of the NTFC. 
This has been covered in a, in a meeting, we would assume. We'd like you to explain a little bit about that. And that's it for the expression of interest. So it's very straightforward. I think it can help in a, a number of ways that I've tried to outline for you today. I would recommend that you, you take a look and feel free to fill in that expression of interest form. The two takeaway points that I would like to leave with you from the presentation are, we do need two representatives from developing countries to sit on the selection committee for the project implementation grants. Now, it would make more sense for us to continue that conversation bilaterally if it's something that you can contribute to, but we need people with project management and TF experience, somebody with agreement from their hierarchy to commit the time necessary, and the understanding that if your country makes an application, you would step back from the selection committee for that assessment. Like I say, please, if you think you can help in that regard, I would love to hear from you following the, following the session today. The final point is here, in all of this process, the TFAF Secretariat is here to help. We'll help guide you through the application process, the expression of interest, any answers to questions that you have. So that's the, the last point that I would like to leave you with. Thank you.